We're on to Unit 2, Periodic Trends. And as we go through Unit 2, I'd like you to take some time to read the, the premise of this whole unit, um, filling out all the blanks and making sense of everything that you're reading as you go through and fill out the main vocabulary words that you see throughout this reading. It's good to actually go back and reread this section at the end of the unit so that you, again, can see the big picture of the whole unit. We use light to study atoms and what they're comprised of as well as their chemical and physical behaviors. And so with light comes waves. And so light behaves like a wave or has wave-like characteristics and thus we, we're really going to dissect into the wave nature of light. The first thing we want to look at is something called wavelength and it has this lambda symbol right here. It looks like an upside down Y. It represents the distance between successive crests or successive troughs. The units we use to measure wavelength is in meters. However, waves, light waves are very small so oftentimes you'll see wavelength in nanometers. Just a quick little remark on nanometers. Nanometers is actually a very, very small unit. Nanometers is 10 to the negative ninth. The word nano means ninth. And if you can recall, milli is 10 to the negative third. So we're looking at six spaces further out between milli and nano. So six spaces, thus the difference in the exponents is six. Wavelength is measured by taking the distance between crest to crest or trough to trough down here. And when you measure it, it's all length. You're measuring the length of this wave. The next definition that we're looking at is wave or frequency. Frequency is in this new symbol right here. It's a Greek letter nu. However, again, I it looks like a V to us. I will refer to it as a V. Um, but it is a new symbol. And that represents the number of waves that pass a given point in time, specifically one second. And it's in units of hertz. And hertz is really exactly what the definition suggests. It's number of waves per second. So notice per second. S to the negative one is the same thing as one over S. Now let's go ahead and count how many waves we see in this diagram right here. So I'm gonna start off on this edge right here and then I'm going to count one wave, full wave, two waves, three waves, four waves. And because this stretch of time is one second as it states right here, we know that there are four waves that we counted from that wave. So we call it four hertz. Again, we can also call it four um, s to the negative 1 if we wanted to because Hertz is the same thing as s to the negative 1. In the next question we're asked which wave A or B has a higher wavelength, higher frequency, and higher energy. So really or higher energy. So those are our, all, all our options. Now if you take a look at this and you measure between crest to crest or trough to trough, this is your wavelength right here also for the for wave B this is your wavelength and it looks like the higher wavelength is going to be B letter B higher frequency so frequency again is the number of waves that pass per second so assuming this is one second right here this ending time right here as well as the ending time right here is one second so you count how many waves you you see passing per second and it looks like there are six waves. So hopefully you can count it and you can see there are six total waves here. And so I'm going to write six hertz on this side. And then on the, for wave B, there are three hertz. Count it and make sure you see that. And so the higher frequency is going to be A, wave A. Now frequency and energy are directly proportional. So if you have higher frequency, you will have also higher energy. So wave A is going to be higher in energy. 
So frequency and energy are directly proportional. This is a great um, graph for the electromagnetic spectrum. And the electromagnetic spectrum ranges from radio waves to gamma rays. Um, there are more beyond this, of course. However, on planet Earth, this is the exposure um, that we get mostly. Um, and so um, this graph, actually, what's nice about this um, model that you see is that it also shows the waves as you go from low energy waves to high energy waves, which are higher frequency, lower frequency on this side. This bar right here tells us what we can actually see on this. And so we can only see the visible light spectrum. We can't see radio waves, microwaves, and infrared, nor can we see UV or X-rays and gamma rays. We can only see visible light, as you see directly up here. Now, visible light has a wavelength of 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. This is the range for visible light's wavelength. Again, that's all we can see along that range. Now, um, visible light is truly all the different colors of the rainbow. Uh, Roy G. Biv is how we look at it. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. And the lower energy radiation part of visible light is the red end, and then the higher energy is the biv end. Now, um, let's go ahead and fill out this part right here, comparing the red relative to ends of the spectrum, the low energy the radio waves versus the gamma rays. By comparison, we know that the wavelength is longer for this left side, shorter for this side. So we're just going to put arrows up and down to show for higher or lower on each side. So here on the left side we're seeing longer wavelengths. And shorter wavelengths here. Frequency. If you look at frequency really closely there's less waves passing per second here, more waves passing per second here. So you're seeing frequency higher on this side and lower on this side. Energy. Well, we said that frequency and energy are directly proportional. One goes up, the other one goes up as well. So on this side, since frequency is down, that means energy is also down. So they're directly proportional. Likewise over here, since frequency is up, energy is up. So there's a direct relationship here between frequency and energy. But there's an inverse relationship between frequency and wavelength. So notice the relationships. It's always important to see relationships. One last item to note on the electromagnetic spectrum are the actual values for the wavelength in meters and then the actual values for frequency. This is really the exponential power, the base of 10. So it's actually an expon scientific notated number. That's why we reviewed scientific notation. But um, these values are the actual 10 to whatever power in that scientific notated value. Now notice how the higher or the lower, or sorry, the higher the wavelength, the lower the frequency. The lower the frequency, wavelength, the higher the frequency. Okay, so you're knowing, noticing the inverse value relationship as you go down this scale where the wavelength is decreasing, thus the frequency is increasing. Let's go ahead and see how to calculate wavelength, frequency, and energy. The equation that you're going to focus on as you as we go through the calculation are the following equations. There's what I call the speed of light equation, where you see the speed of light, and of course wavelength and frequency multiplied gives you the speed of light. Then there's also the equation for energy. This is our energy equation equaling Planck's constant, which is this h constant, as well as 
frequency, so multiplying those two. And you'll see a direct relationship between frequency and energy and an inverse relationship between energy or uh, frequency and wavelength. So let's go ahead and work through these example questions. It says right here, a helium laser emits with, with a wavelength of 633 nanometers. What is the frequency of that light? The first thing I want to do is see what variables I have. And it looks like I have the following variables. I have wavelength and I'm trying to find frequency. So going over to the side with my two equations, the equation I'm going to use is this top equation because I have both wavelength and frequency or I'm trying to find one or the other and I'm given the speed of light. Speed of light is 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So substituting those values in 3.00 times 10 to the negative or 10 to the eighth power and it's in meters per second. I'm going to put the units in so you can see how the units work out. Taking my wavelength, now I notice that my wavelength is actually in units of nanometers. And I don't want it in nanometers. I actually want to convert it to meters. So to convert nanometers to, to meters is moving this number, the decimal point, over six spaces to the left. Because between milli, or uh, it's not six, nine spaces. So you're going nine spaces to the left. Now, instead of having to do that and memorize that, you, you can actually do what is called dimensional analysis. So I'm going to show you really quick how to change the units, the metric units. We know that nanometers needs to cancel out. And we know we want meters on top. So we say that in one meter, as we see over here, in one meter, there's 1 times 10 to the 9th, but I'm just going to put 10 to the 9th because I don't need the 1 there. And so when you divide these two numbers, all you're doing in your calculator is putting 633 divide, because you're dividing, notice the fraction, by E9. So when you do that, you'll see your answer being, again, using that E button is important, 6.33 times 10 to the negative seventh meters. So this is my wavelength in meters. I'm going to plug it into my wavelength for my wavelength. And what I'm trying to solve for is my frequency. So, and wavelength is in meters. Um, when I do this, I divide, I'm going to have to divide this number over here and that will give me my answer. Notice the units really quick. Notice how this is meters per second and this is meters. This frequency has to be one over seconds so that this side units can equal this side units. And it will be when you divide this meters, this unit of meters over too. So my answer is right here. Once I divide this whole value over to here. Make sure you use that E button, E8. E negative 7. So use your E button when you're doing your calculation. Let's go to number 2. In number 2, by the way, you should pause and work through these problems on your own if you're feeling pretty comfortable with just substituting these um, variables into the equation. If you're not, keep on looking at the example until you can pause and do the problems on your own. It says, what is the, what is the wavelength of x-rays having a frequency of 4.80 times 10 to the 17th power. So I'm going to label that my frequency right here and I'm trying to solve for wavelength. And again, I see my two variables, my wavelength and my frequency. I know it's going to be the speed of light equation. Substituting all my values in, I get um, speed of light, which is 3.00 times 10 to the eighth power meters per second. I'm going to put the units in. You don't have to, but I'm going to do so, so you can see how the units work out. Wavelength is my unknown variable, and then I'm going to substitute my frequency in. Once again, I'm going to divide 
both sides by 4.80 times 10 to the 17th, both sides, and that will let me solve for my wavelength. My wavelength in the end is going to be in, meter, in, in meters 6.25 times 10 to the negative 10th meters, or when you convert it to nanometers, back to nanometers, it would be 0.625 nanometers. Going to number three, finishing it off once again, or er, pause if you find yourself being able to do these problems so you can work through them yourself. You'll be a better learner if you can work through these problems by yourself. The next question is asking for energy, and it gives us frequency, which is V here. So I'm going to use Planck's constant, which is 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 times my frequency. And it's in joules times seconds. I'm going to put the units in there. Um, I need to calculate energy. Oh, I have frequency. My apologies. So I'm going to substitute frequency in. 5.02 times 10 to the 20th power. And it's in hertz. And notice, again, hertz is 1 over seconds, 1 over seconds also. So 1 over seconds times seconds gives cancels out my seconds, leaving me with joules at my end. So my answer is 3.33 times 10 to the negative 13 joules. Please make sure you're entering these values into your calculator so you can practice calculating with these sign or multiplying with these scientific notated numbers. The last problem. You're calculating E again, energy, um, and you're given wavelength here in nanometers. So it looks like I'm going to actually use both equations here. I'm first going to try to find, use the speed of light equation so that I can try to find the frequency. And then I'm going to take that frequency and substitute it right here to find the energy. So I'm going to do both equation, and I'm going to use one to solve for the other as well. Substituting everything in. So I'm going to start off with speed of light equation. Um, well, I'm going to have to convert. So take your calculator and take 49 divided by E9. And I get a number that in scientific notation is 4.9 times 10 to the negative 8th meters. So this is converted into meters. And then I'm trying to solve for frequency. So when I solve for frequency, which is, so I'm going to take 3e to the 8th divided by 4.9e to the negative 8, I get 6.12 times 10 to the 15th power. And then I'm going to use the speed of light equation, or um, the energy equation. With Planck's constant. And I'm going to multiply the frequency, which is this one, this number, 6. Point, out of room, 6.12 times 10 to the 15th power. And that's in 1 over seconds. Notice I'm putting 1 over seconds instead of hertz. Notice the seconds cancel out, leaving me with joules as my ending value. And my answer in the end should be 4.06 times 10 to the negative 18th. We used light to study um, different atoms. And specifically, we like to study hydrogen for the purpose of its simplicity. If you think about hydrogen, it's the smallest element on the periodic table. Um, has very few protons, very few electrons, and very few neutrons as well. So because of that, we use techniques of spectroscopy, atomic emission spectroscopy, to understand 
the structure of an atom, this, um, in this case hydrogen. So I've got hydrogen here and we know hydrogen has one proton and no neutrons if you're looking at the most abundant isotope inside the nucleus. It has one electron also. Now this one electron depending is on the first energy level. So 1n means the first energy level, 2n means the second energy level, third, fourth, so on, so forth, fifth. We call these, this fancy word for energy level is principal quantum number. So we say this is in quantum number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so on. Um, the ground state is basically the lowest ener or lower energy state of an electron in an atom. So this is the ground state for hydrogen's one valence electron and only le electron. So when we when we apply and zap this atom with light, what happens is the electron absorbs that energy and jumps to a different energy level. Let's talk about the different energy levels. If the electron jumps to the third energy level and then returns back down to a so currently that electron is in the excited state being on the third ele uh, energy level. Now excited state by definition is the state in which the atom has a greater number of energy than its ground state. Now unstable there because where does an electron want to go? Closest to the nucleus where it's drawn. That electron is drawn towards the nuclear charge here. So what happens is that electron will return back to what is called the ground state. Now in this case I'm going to state that the ground state is anything lower. It doesn't have to be the original state, but it's anything lower. Upon moving back down, what happens is the energy gets released by that electron in the form of light. So you're seeing in an emitted form of light and that energy is called our photon. So this is a photon of light, light energy. Now this is happening simultaneous as more as energy is is applied to the atom. Energy is constantly applied to this hydrogen atom. Now the energy currently which is or the electron which is currently in the second energy level will absorb that energy, jump up to the fourth principal quantum number course in the excited state, unstable in the excited state, the electron will return back to the ground state and in doing so, which is the second energy level, emitting energy that is blue here, blue light. And, and then this is again happening again and again. The electron goes on to, to the fifth energy level returning back down to the second energy level, releasing even more energy. Now I don't have a purple photon, so or I don't have a purple pen, so you're seeing different waves of light. Um, I'm going to label this purple or indigo slash purple. And once again, this is red light. And then this is your blue light. Now created as a result of all this emission from hydrogen's atom is this atomic emission, hydrogen's atomic emission spectrum. And this is actually the spectral lines that we would see. And once again, if I had different colors, I actually would see these two spectrums spectral lines as well. Now why is it that different colors are admitted? But you'll, So you'll notice that sometimes when hydrogen's electron jumped to the third energy level and returned back to the second energy, less energy is emitted because it's um, because the release or the return back of the electron back to the ground state is lower in energy. Whereas if you see a greater drop 
in energy return back to the ground state, you're seeing a little bit more energy. So blue light is a little bit more energy. And you actually can see it to be more energy through the wavelength. I kind of I had hoped to make the wavelength represented. The wavelength is smaller here for the blue light as opposed to the red light. And of course, when you measure it against this the um, indigo or the purple light, the wavelength definitely for the purple light is smaller. So there's more energy, higher energy here and lower energy here on the red. Higher energy in the violet side and then lower energy in the red side. So now where do we use the word quanta? I haven't used the word quanta. I've used principal quantum number, ground state, excited state, quantum or photon, but I've not used quanta or quantum of energy. Now that by definition it means the minimum amount of energy that can be lost or gained by an electron and atom. So for an, for this electron to move to another energy level, that electron must absorb that quanta of energy in order to move. And so to describe it afterwards, that quanta of energy is also released as a result. And that's where you get that red photon. Um, the, the word quanta is where we get this quantum mechanical model. So this next question is a question that's conceptual and, of course, higher thinking, critical thinking. You're discussing whether the co color photon by lithium and fluorine atoms, so one is lithium and the other one's fluorine atoms, um, why their transitions would be, whether the transitions would be the same or different when their electrons transition from the n equals 3 to the n equals 2 in both atoms. So here you have lithium transition its electron going from the excited state back down to um, on the third level back down to the second level. Here you have fluorine's electrons going dropping down energy level. You should also look at the sizing. Look at notice how there's a difference in size between the third energy level here and the third energy level. So hopefully you can think about that, pause it, think through, write your answer and explain whether th the photon emitted will be the same or different when those electrons transition from the third energy level to the second. Now after you've paused it, hopefully you've thought through it critically, had have an answer of some sort written down, wrong or right, at least you've had the opportunity to think through it. You'll notice that fluorine has more protons. So that greater number of protons will draw in all of its electrons even closer to the nucleus than the weaker charge that's in the in lithium's uh, nu nucleus. So fluorine's transition is going to be different in energy than lithium's. Now how different you won't have to explain but it will be different because fluorine um, the drop will be close, this energy difference will be due to the closeness that ele those electrons will be towards, drawn towards this nuclear charge. Weaker force is going to be causing this electron to move and transition between the N3 and N2 and so you're probably going to see definitely a weaker drop in energy compared to this uh, fluorine. Next up, we're going to learn about electron configuration. By studying the atoms' atomic emission spectra of different elements, we can put electrons in various addresses or locations on the periodic table. These locations are called atomic orbitals, including S block, P block, D block. Let's check where these locations blocks are on the periodic table and I'd like you to bring some coloring tools out right now so that you can color your S a certain color, your P a certain color, by the way helium is a part of the S, your D a certain color, and F. And you, you are going to color your key legend based on the color, key, whatever color you're using, your color key, okay? 
So go ahead and pause and color. And as you're coloring, please also um, label it 1s, 2s, 3s. So it's actually labeled according to your energy levels here. So this is in the s orbital. So this is called the 1s. This is in the this is the um, s orbital also, but it's on the second energy level. So this is called the 2s. That's why this is called the 2p right here. Okay. Pause, color, and um, make sure you label the orbitals, what's in yellow here. All right, after you've labeled everything, let's go ahead and go down here, and we're going to understand how to read this periodic table and the atomic orbitals and these locators, that you're, these locations that you see. There's three types of ways we're going to configure electrons, three different notations. There's the orbital, electron configuration notation, and the noble gas notation. We're going to do phosphorus. It has a Z of 15, which means its atomic number is 15, so it's right here. As we do phosphorus, um, watch and learn. Now the way we read the orbitals is we read it like a book. And so any book is read from left to right going downward. So we read the orbitals and locations just like that. And so for instance, we start off always with the 1s then the 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, and then comes the 3d, 4p, 5s, 4d, 5p, 6s. Now notice how lanthanum is where you start seeing the f go into play. So after 6s is the 4f, 5d, 6p, 7s, and then once again, this is the, the beginning of the 5F, 5F, and then it follows through over here to the 6D, and then if we find elements, more and more elements, there will be 7P. So this is how we read the periodic table, like a book, and those are all locations. So they're like addresses where electrons will be located. So let's go ahead and learn how to do these three configurations using phosphorus. So phosphorus, I'm going to circle it on the periodic table. It's right here. Now, again, reading phosphorus's config, um, address is like this, 1s. And since there's two electrons, remember how these boxes represent the electrons? How many electrons there are in that, uh, in that energy level? Well, it's going to represent how many electrons are in that orbital as well. So it's 1s, 2 and then 2s2, so there's two of them, 1, or 1 and 2 here, and then 2p6, 3s2, and then when we get to phosphorus here, it's just 3p3, 1, 2, 3, and we stop there. So let's go ahead and write what is called the electron configuration below here four phosphorus. Once again, it's four phosphorus. 1s with two electrons, 2s with two electrons, 2p with six electrons, 3s with two electrons, and 3p with only three electrons. Now if you add up all the electrons, and I'm going to circle the electrons so you can see them, if you add up all these electrons, you should end up with 15 electrons. And so now we've got the address, the complete address for all the electrons and where they're in their corresponding atomic orbitals. Okay. Once again, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, and then 3p123. And that's where we end at 3 here for 3p3. Now, noble gas notation is a simplified form of the electron configuration. And when, we, when I say simplified, all you're doing is you're looking at the element, what you're trying to represent, and the noble gases that come right before. And the noble gases are right here. So I should label it and let you see that really quick. So this is where the noble, all the whole column, the whole column is where the noble gases reside. Okay. 
the element that comes right before or the noble gas that, that comes right before phosphorus is neon so you're really going backwards reading the book backwards and you see that's neon and notice neon ends at 2p6 so I know that from here to here from all the way from 1s2 to 2p6 is the representation of the noble gas neon so this part is only neon so what I do when I write the noble gas notation is I just represent neon right there and it, all the orbitals that follow. Now what are the orbitals that follow? So I've already represented neon by putting neon in brackets right there. Now all the orbitals that follow are these two orbitals right here. So it's 3s2 and 3p3. Let's go ahead and do the orbital notation. The orbital notation is a little bit long and drawn out, so um, I'm going to need a little room. I'm going to do the orbital notation up here, okay? That gives me a little bit more room, so I'm going to do the orbital notation up here. And this is for phosphorus. Now, to do the orbital notation, I like to look at the electron configuration, okay? So it starts off with 1s and I'm going to draw the 1s as so. It's just a line and I'm going to draw two electrons as we stated in the 1s. So there are two electrons housed. So basically the orbit notation looks like the parking lot itself. You're showing exactly where the electrons are housed. The 1s only has one line. S only holds two electrons. Now we go to the 2s. 2s also holds only two electrons, so I'm going to put two arrows. Each arrow represents an electron. Now the 2p, the p's hold six electrons, so I'm going to have three lines. Each parking lot can only hold two electrons, so, so here are my six electrons in the 2p. And then I go into my 3s. My 3s can hold two electrons only, and that's how many it will hold for phosphorus. Now we get to the 3p. When we get to the 3p, we, we know that there's only three electrons in the 3p. So when we label it, we're, or we're only going to place exactly just that, three electrons in the 3p. But we like to spread them out into their own little location because electrons like to repel each other. They don't like to be right next to each other until they have to. So when they have to, they're going to have to. But first, we're going to spread them out far apart from each other as possible in their own locations. All right, I want you to pause the video and work through some more problems on the next page. So what you're going to do is you're going to draw, you're going to do the electron configuration, noble gas notation, orbit notation. Oh, you're going to also do the Lewis dot. So let's go ahead and do the Lewis dot. Um, the Lewis dot is always going to represent um, the valence electron. So when you're drawing the, electro the Lewis dot, the electron dot, every dot represents the valence electron. So we know that phosphorus is in group 1 5a. So you'll notice 5a, which means it's got five valence electrons. You can actually tell the five valence electrons right here. There's five total right here as well if you want. It's the outermost energy level, which is the third energy level, third energy level, and there's five of them, third energy, five of them. So the electron dot is basically drawing the element symbol and in this case it's phosphorus and every dot is going to be a valence electron and we treat it as though we're drawing each side again electrons are gonna spread out around the atom and there's gonna be a total of five so here are my five valence or valence electrons around phosphorus so that is the electron dot for phosphorus so this is now your turn go ahead and pause the video and work through these problems doing the electron configuration, noble gas configuration, orbital notation, electron dot, also called the Lewis dot, and then the common ion of what the atom will become as a result of filling out um, its energy levels, having a full energy level. Um, go ahead and work through it, pause. You can 
try to walk through the first one as well, but make sure you're doing in it independently without looking at the answer. This is the answer key ultimately in the end. Um, let's go ahead and look at the bottom problems. Give the name and symbol of each of the following elements. So I'm looking for an element that goes all the way to the 3s1. I go to the 3s1 location on the periodic table and I see that that element must be um, sodium. So sodium is my answer, Na. The next, I also, uh, for B, I'm doing the same thing. I like to go to the tail end and I see 3P6, 4S2, but there's a 3D3. So I know that there's 4S being filled, but then there's a 3D3. It looks like vanadium. So vanadium V. Moving on to the next one. I see 3, 2P3, so on the periodic table I find 2P, where the lo location of 2Ps are, which is on the second energy level in the P orbital, and 3 would be nitrogen. And then for the last one, once again, I'm looking at the last orbitals for S1, and I know that it must be potassium. I go to the 4S orbital, and I see it's potassium. Symbol K. Um, let's go ahead and go to number 2. The 2s holds a maximum of 2 electrons, the 4p6, the 3d10, 1p6, although this does not exist, this is non-existence. Uh, if it had um, electrons, 6 could only be held in the p orbitals, always. All right, let's keep on going to the bottom. Write the noble gas configuration for the falling elements. So you're practicing. Um, work through number three and beyond on your own. The answer key are, will be located below at the bottom of this set of problems. So Understanding by atomic emission spectroscopy, this methodology, this instrumentation, um, this technique, we've been able to understand much more about an atom and what it looks like. And so now in competition to our old Bohr model, we have the current model for us, which is the quantum mechanical model. This is our currently adopted model for an atom. So let's go ahead and see the contrasting between the quantum mechanical model and the Bohr model. And we'll talk about it as well. So the quantum mechanical model are made up of these atomic orbitals. There's the 1s. And the s looks like a sphere. It's rounded. So this is a 2. Um, the 1s is right out here, inside here, 1s. And then this is the 2s. And then the P's are dumbbell looking. So there's the 2PY along the Y axis. There's the 2PX along the X axis. And then the 2PZ. Now understand this is all three dimensional. So you're looking at regions in space. These orbitals, all they represent is regions in space where there's a high probability of finding an electron. So this is based on the quantum model. The Bohr model looks like this. You've got the nuclei just like you have in the quantum model. But you have these rings that orbitals, or sorry, these circular orbits basically, very similar to the quantum model, but they notice how they're, you don't see the dumbbell shape. You actually see spheres more so. But the Bohr model only has circular spherical shapes. Now, we've always known that the first energy level has two electrons, the second energy level has eight, and then eight, and then eight continued on. However, to edit, this Bohr model to make it more of what is our current adopted model which is called the quantum mechanical model we're gonna edit this now what you're saying but why don't we just adopt this 
This model is a really complex model to draw as well as to help understand a lot of the properties of elements on the periodic table. So we're really going to st we're still going to stick to the Bohr model for its for the sake of its sim simplicity. Now the first elect first energy level has only the 1s orbital in the Bohr model, so it makes sense that two electrons can only be held on the first energy level. And the second energy level, there's the s and the p. S holds 2, P holds 6, so it makes sense that there's 8 electrons. Now we get into the third energy level. The third energy level has the 3S, the 3P, as well as the 3D. So we're looking at adding 10 more electrons to the third energy level, giving us a total of 18 electrons. I'm going to make it a different color for the fourth energy level so it would be easier for us to see. The fourth energy level is made up of the S, the P, the D, and the F. Now the S holds 2, the P holds 6, which makes sense for the 8 that we see here, but then the D holds 10, so plus another 10 electrons. And then the F holds 14. So tally that up and you will get 32 electrons. So you're seeing a total of 32 electrons on the fourth energy level. Okay, so now this is our edited version of the Bohr model. So we're still going to use the Bohr model for the sake of its simplicity, but understand that this quantum model is what we currently adopt and that's why we have these orbitals that we can configure into their corresponding location or configure electrons into their corresponding locations. Types of elements and common ions. We've gone over this before but it's good for us to actually officially introduce it with, with rules. So there's two types of um, ways an atom becomes stable and that's when it becomes an ion. Um, and in becoming an ion, that atom has what is called a full outer shell, and that full outer shell would be eight electrons. And so that full eight on the second energy beyond, so atoms will tend to lose, in, uh, sh lose gain, uh, and share electrons in order to have that full eight in the end. So this goes into understanding why atoms will bond in the end in order to fulfill the octet rule. Now the duet rule occurs only on the second energy level or the first energy level because if you're an atom that has only electrons on the first energy level, you can only have two electrons max in the first energy level. So we call it the duet rule, just like a singing duet, two only. The objective for all atoms and the stability for all atoms or ions is to be isoelectronic with the noble gas. Um, they have to have a octet or duet. There are several ways to say it, to have full energy levels or full shells, to achieve a noble gas configuration or a pseudo noble gas configuration. Um, these are all ways for which we describe ourselves or describe an atom to have stability in the end. Thus, the atom will become a common ion. Isoelectronic means the same number of electrons. If you dissect the word iso, iso means the same. So iso means same. And then electronic is very easy. It's the word electron. So uh, electrons, same number of electrons. An example for something that is isoelectronic is Ca2 plus, Ca1 Ca2+, plus, K+, plus, and S2- minus and P3- minus are all isoelectronic ions. A good way to look at it or go to the periodic table and you can actually see those ions be isoelectronic. And I'm going to do it using, I'm going to go ahead and use this here. So calcium's right here, right here on your periodic table. Take a look at your periodic table to see calcium very quickly. Calcium losing 2 will be isoelectronic with argon. Potassium's right here, and it will lose one of its valent, the one and only valence electron that it has on the 4s orbital, and now potassium ion is isoelectronic with argon. 
sulfur is right here, gaining two will make sulfur isoelectronic with argon. Phosphorus is right here, gaining one, two, three will then gain, um, make phosphide ion isoelectronic with argon. So all of these ions are actually isoelectronic with a noble gas, argon. And that is one of our ways an atom can be uh, stable when it has when it achieves that atom achieves a noble gas configuration so noble gases have very um, are stable inert elements and they have full shells for the because of that or because they have um, full shells they are stable okay so let's go ahead and look at how um, different cations or anions are created either losing an electron or gaining an electron. The, the cation is a positive ion, the anion is the negative ion. So let's look at these two examples and see why each of those examples would either gain or lose electrons. So let me start off with the configuration. Sodium is 1s2, 2s2, 2p, 6, 3, S, 1. Sorry, I'm going to have to make sure that um, 3, S looks like it's 3, S with an exponential 1 there. Okay. Fluorine is 1, S, 2, 2, S, 2, and 2, P, 5. All right. Now, Let's do ions, okay? So taking a look at fluorine or sodium, you notice that sodium has one valence electron on its outermost valence shell. Now that's not stable, so the best thing for, for sodium to do is actually two options. Gain seven and get eight on that third shell, which is a full octet, or lose one. Losing one is easier because by then the inner shell will be full. So we're, we're going to see sodium lose one electron. As a result of losing one electron, you'll see some math charge balancing be, or the charges between the protons and the electron or protons and the electrons will be different. So we know that sodium always has 11 protons. And uh, now sodium has only 10 electrons because it lost one. So it lost one electron. Um, now let's do some math. Algebraically, we always know, we've always learned that if we have a positive charge here and a negative charge and we add those numbers together, as we see here, it's being added together, what is the overall charge? The charge is going to be positive 1. And so this is precisely what sodium ion is going to be or have as its common ion. Its common ion is Na with a plus one charge. So sodium, being that it's a metal, or this is error, being that it's a metal, so there's a mistake here, and tends to lose electrons to achieve a full energy level. So metals, we'll see some patterns as far as what metals do. Now let's go over to fluorine. Fluorine is a nonmetal and tends to gain electrons to have a full shell. And you, you'll see why, it will, why fluorine will more likely gain an electron as you explore its Bohr model. So exploring fluorine's Bohr model, you'll notice that fluorine has seven valence electrons on its outer shell, on its outer second quantum number, principal quantum number. And so fluorine with seven would like to gain one more, and so that's precisely what fluorine will do, gain an electron. So it will gain one electron. Upon gaining an electron, now sodium, or fluorine, which has nine protons, and it's positively charged uh, with the nine protons, and now 10 electrons, the charge balance is going to be negative 1, so the common ion is F with a negative 1 charge. As we see from this example, that fluorine is a nonmetal and tends to gain electrons to full 
to achieve a full energy level. So what we're going to do is do some more coloring. You're going to color your type of element charts, periodic table, with metal, non-metal, and metalloid, and make sure you color it. And now, once you color it, then you're going to fill out your common ions. So you're writing all the common ions that you see on this periodic table, even the ones that typify what they are along the groups. And then you're going to sit there and go, oh, what am I noticing about all the positives? You'll notice that all the positives are all your metals. What do we notice about all the negatives? You'll notice matched over here that they're all non-metals. Okay, so you're really looking at some patterns as far as how the metals and non-metals behave based on what their chart common ions tend to be, whether they're cations or anions. Okay. Now you're going to compare the number of, uh, so pause and, and make sure you should do that. Um, afterwards, you're going to compare the number of protons and electrons in SN2+, and you account for the charge of the 2 plus in tin 2 uh, ions. Now tin has uh, 50 protons. Tin also has, um, that plus 2 means now tin has more protons than electrons, so 2 more, which means tin has 48 electrons. You do your math, positive. I'm going to go over here because I'm out of room on the bottom. So you're going to do some math and you're going to see that a positive 50 plus a negative 48 gives you a positive 2. So that, that's where the math and the charge balance works out. Okay. Hopefully that 50 doesn't look too bad after you edit a little. Pause and go ahead and work through the rest of the problems up here. Answers on the bottom. Please make sure you work through it yourself and build the skill of understanding through working it out. All right. Now we're going to go back to Coulomb's Law, periodic trends and Coulomb's Law, how they're connected. I'd like you to continue coloring. More coloring is occurring here. Continue coloring the different types of classifications of elements. So this is here the alkali metals, alkali earth metals, transition metals, boron family, carbon family, nitrogen family, oxygen family, halogens, and of course the notorious noble gases. These are lanthanides as the first element of this group, the 4F, and then actinides as the first element of the 5F. I'd like you to go ahead and color it and study the different classification of elements. Um, pause and do that. Uh, now let's go ahead and review Coulomb's Law as the law will provide reasons to basically the different um, properties, physical and chemical properties, such as atomic radius, ionization, energy, electronegativity, electron affinity of the elements on the periodic table. Let's go review. All right, let's go back to Coulomb's Law. If you recall, it's F equals K times Q1, Q2 over D squared. Q is about your charges, and thus we will use Zeph to help us to understand charge. And then D is about our distance, which we use as the energy levels. Now, charge is a effective nuclear charge, Zeph, which is the attraction between the positive nuclear charge, um, which is the protons, on its valence electrons. N, which is the energy levels, are shells where electrons are located around the nucleus of an atom. So the more N, more energy levels, the greater the number of electrons on each of those shells. As you go across from left to right, the number of protons increases, which increases the effective nuclear charge, which is the Zeph, causing the protons to pull more on the electrons while on the same energy level. So this should be N. Thus, the force increases. Coulomb's law states nuclear core charge is quantified by calculating the Zeph. Again, we're focused on Q1 or Q2. Increasing Q1 or Q2 will increase the force. So we use Zeph as our proof for that. 
So calculating these F is just protons minus the inner shell electrons. I wanted to show you atoms that had three rings so you can really understand what the inner shell electrons are. So let's go ahead and look at the first one. In the first example, um, you have sodium as our first example. Now sodium has 11 protons minus inner shells. And so let's go to the Bohr model to understand what the inner shells are. Now the valence shell is on the outermost tier. The inner shell would be the n equals 1 and n equals 2. So principal quantum number 1 and 2. So count and tally up all the electrons in the first energy level and the second energy level. And that ends up being 10. So 11 minus 10 gives you 1. So the ZEF for sodium is 1. So I'd like you to work through all of these problems all the way to the end here. I have a couple of answers there, but or the final answers for all of them, but I really would like you to make sure you work through all of them. The same way, you take the number of protons and you minus the inner shell, and so the 4 is the ZEF for, or so, for silicon. And likewise for chlorine and sodium or argon, those are the, your ZEF. But I'd like you to work through the calculations for each part of these, okay? Magnesium, aluminum, phosphorus, and sulfur. Now, what are you noticing? After you've worked through those problems, what you're noticing is that the ZEF is increasing across that period. This is period number three here, by the way. That's why it has three energy levels. Period number three. You're seeing the ZEF increasing as the core charge increases. So ZEF, core charge is increasing, protons are increasing, thus the ZEF is increasing as well. So I'd like you to work through the ZEF calculations for all of these elements right here. And the answer key once again are, is in the bottom so you can um, understand that. I'm just gonna work through the first one and then you can kind of roll from there. Um, 15 is phosphorus number protons minus the inner shell. Now, since phosphorus is on the third energy level, the inner shell would be the second and first. So that would be 8 plus 2, which is 10, and that gives me 5. So the ZEF for phosphorus is 5, as we see up here as well. So we can actually check some of them if it's on the third energy or third energy level. So check them all and make sure you understand that. In the example number two, it says compare the ionic radii, the ionic radii of both sodium ion and fluoride ion. So look at the periodic table and check them both out. And it looks like they're both isoelectronic to neon. So they're both isoelectronic with each other and also neon. So um, what you do is now they have the same number of electrons as the word isoelectronic is defined as. What we're going to really go after is the number of protons because electrons and the protons are the ones that are really going to dictate the, the trends of an atom. Um, and it looks like sodium has 11 protons. So I'm going to put 11 protons. Fluoride ion has 9 protons, looking at the periodic table. The one that has the greater number of protons will have a stronger nuclear charge. So this one has a stronger core charge. And so our explanation would be that if, if Sodium, since sodium has a stronger core charge because it has 11 protons versus fluoride ion, which has only 9 protons, um, sodium is going to pull its electrons closer to the nuclei, making sodium be, or sodium ion be a smaller ion than fluoride, fluoride ion. And you can go to the ZEF calculation, but really, I mean, they both have the same number of electrons. So ultimately, what differs is the number of protons. So um, you can read my explanation. There's variations to that explanation, but hopefully it's all the same idea where the stronger charge leads to a stronger force, thus the ion ends up being smaller. Let's go down to group trend 
group trend. As you go down the group, the principal quantum number, n, or the energy level, increases, which increase this, increases the distance while the zeph stays the same for the atom in the same group. Thus, force decreases. So Coulomb's saw states that as you increase in distance, down here in the denominator, force decreases. We've seen that mathematically. Increase in distance decreases the force. And so that's exactly what you're seeing as you go down a group. The increase in energy levels as you go from one element to the next down a group will lead to a weaker force. Now, notice this says that the ZEF stays the same. So I, I would like to do some ZEF calculations for a few of them. So we're going to do a few of them just so that it can prove that to us that the ZEF stays the same. So we're going to do the ZEF for hydrogen, and we're going to do the ZEF for lithium, and the ZEF for sodium. We'll just do them all. ZEF for potassium. And we're good at calculating ZEF at this point, hopefully. So you have one protons, no inner shell, so the ZEF is one. Lithium has three protons, two inner shell, and ZEF is one. Sodium has 11 protons, 10 inner shell electrons, and the ZEF is one. Notice so far the ZEF is one for all the elements in the same group. Now we go to potassium. Potassium has 19 protons minus, and if you count very carefully the inner shell of potassium here, you'll see that it has 18, 18 inner shell and that's one. So the ZEF does stay the same. So ZEF is the same down a group. So what's changing is the distance because of the added energy levels. And that's what we're seeing right here as you go downward. Oops. All right, um, with that knowledge, Let's go ahead and now we know the, the calculation for the evidence of our charge as well as energy levels. Um, we can now understand, we're going to dive into understanding how these properties are um, important. Okay, so we're, we're going to define these properties and then we're going to utilize and understand the different trends, but we're not going to memorize any of this part. You do have to memorize your definition. So. so atomic radius is half the distance between nuclei of two adjacent atoms of the same element. Um, that can be really easily understood by modeling a little bit. So if I have two atoms, here's the nuclei of one atom. So I'm going to put it positive charge. And then here's a nuclei of an adjacent atom. What you do is you find the distance from here to, from the nuclei, and you half that distance. That is what is called the radius, the atomic radius. Okay. Um, now the ionic radius is basically the the um, the radius of an ion, cation or an anion, depending. But when you compare it to its neutral self and the cation or anion of the same element, you will find that the anion is going to be greater than the cation. So the anion is greater than the cation, which is greater than the, or sorry, the anion is greater than the neutral element, which is greater than the cation. And um, yeah, so you're seeing the radius have a trend also. Now, it's nice to compare isoelectronic when it comes to ions, and so you can see the different trends going across the periodic table along the period or down the group. Um, okay. Ionization energy is the minimum amount of energy to remove an electron. So there's different types of ionization energy. There's first, second, and third. And, and what you're seeing, it's best to see it off of a uh, model. And I'm going to show you in the next page. So in this model, you're noticing that when I pull the first electron, which is the outermost, you always start pulling on the outer ring, and then you start, and then you go into the inner rings. So here's my first ionization energy, I1. 
Here's my second I2, but this could also be my second. It doesn't matter which one you designate second when it's on the same energy level. So this is my second, and then here's my third, and that's really all for lithium. Lithium only has three valence or three electrons, period. One valence electron. Electron affinity is the energy change when an electron is gained by an atom from uh, in the ga gaseous stage state to form an anion. So here we have an atom in the gaseous state. G stands for gas. An electron is added and gained and now the the atom now becomes a negative anion. And of course energy is released as a result. Okay. And of course you can see the trends there. Electronegativity is really discussed in bonding. So it's the ability to attract electrons uh, and at the ability of an atom to attract electrons towards itself in a chemical bond. So it's towards another atom's electrons. So here I have the two atoms, one that has an attraction for one the adjacent atom's valence electron, and of course the opposite the other atom nuclear charge is attracted to the valence electron of the adjacent and that's what really tailors the bonding that this is what makes to the two atoms come together and bond in the end so this is going to be heavily our next units discussion you'll hear me talk about electronegativity again because electronegativity guides bonding in the end all right there are different level questions what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do a few from maybe one and then I'm gonna have you work through the rest okay so that you can get a better stronger understanding I might even jump down to do a, a few down below but the answer key is on the very end of this um, packet and we are at the tail end of the packet it says right here arrange the following atoms in order of increasing ionization so I'm going from low to high so low ionization to high ionization energy. The first thing I want to do, the first foremost thing I want to do is figure out what energy level each of these elements are. So knowing the energy level first and foremost will help me to be able to determine the force from that. Strontium is on the fifth energy level. Cesium is on the sixth energy level. Um, sulfur is on the third so that's the first thing that's the easiest thing for you to do actually because it's all written on the periodic table where the how many energy levels that element has fluorine is on the second and then arsenic is on the fourth so from that alone you can actually figure out ionization energy um, easily we know that ionization energy is the energy to remove an electron so the smaller the smaller the atom, the harder it is to remove an electron. So fluorine will be up on top here. Then comes sulfur, arsenic, strontium, and then cesium. So from low to high, just from the energy levels, we can actually see who goes where. So cesium is first, is the lowest. Then comes strontium, arsenic, sulfur, and then fluorine. So that's your ionization energy. It does certainly, hopefully, it should make sense that the smaller the atom, the harder it is to remove an electron from that atom, fluorine being the smallest. All right, I'm going to jump down to, so you can do sizing also. We know easily that fluorine is the smallest as well, right? From here, the energy level, smallest. So you can actually go by sizing after you look at those ideas, okay? I'm going to jump down to number six really quick. I'll just do A, and then um, we you can proceed to do the rest of these level one questions. Um, copper here is neutral. Copper here has uh, is a two plus cation here. Uh, that means copper has lost electrons. Losing electrons will make you smaller. Have, gaining electrons will make you bigger. So the logic is really easy. Copper is going to be the larger species. So I'm going to circle 
neutral copper. This is neutral. You don't have to write the zero in. Okay. So now we get into these level two questions, which are a little bit more difficult. They're about successive ionization energy and even learning how to write those equations as well. So here I have some data, R and S in kilojoules per mole. R and S are in the same period of the periodic table and are adjacent to one another. Now the thing about ionization energy, so you're, this is the first, this is the second, this is the third, they're a summative value, which means the second will be the energy, this 1680, plus whatever else is the difference to remove that second electron. So to really see how, many le how much energy is to remove that third electron, you take the difference to really see that. Um, so here's the other thing. When it comes to ionization energies, what I like to do is I like to see where there's a huge jump. Now why the huge jump? Because I know that where the huge jump occurs, or huge difference, that is where you're actually moving into an inner shell, not the, so all the other ionization energies will be valence shells, that are, valence electrons that are being removed. So I study, it. and when I study it, I'm looking for like how big of a jump I see. When I see a significantly big jump right here between these two numbers, I, I know that my element has seven valence electrons and then the eighth one will be an inner shell electron. So we're moving the eighth one below the valence shell here. So that's how I know. And then I make note of that whenever I see anything that as I study, I'm like, okay, this one has seven valence electrons. Now I'm going to study S as well. Do the same thing to study. You're looking to see where there's the biggest jump as you go from left to right, from first ionization to the next. Huge jump. I see a huge jump here. So it looks like S has eight valence electrons. So in which group would one find R? So I would expect R to have seven valence electrons and we now know the classification name of that 7A group. Those are the fluor have the halogens and so we call them the halogens. The halogens would have would be element R. And again, the explanation comes and then you can go because, and I hope you can explain it, based on what we described here. We saw that the there was a, a large jump in ionize, increase in ionization energy between the seventh and eighth, so we can assume that from one to seven are all valence electrons, and the halogens all have seven valence electrons. Um, you can continue answering all these questions going downward, hopefully, and then um, checking your answers in the answer key. Here's the answer key. As we discussed earlier, you're checking as you go. Please make sure you answer things thoroughly and make sure you match it against your answer key to, to ensure what thorough responses are needed. So now we go into explanations using Coulomb's law. This is the hardest level types of questions. You're explaining each of the following observations. I'll do A first and then you can do the rest. There's not a lot, so do the rest afterwards, okay? Let's start off. Sodium has a lower first ionization energy than lithium. Now, sodium, if I look on the periodic table, is on the third energy level. Once again, I'm trying to set myself up for an explanation by saying what energy level they both are as a comparison. So lithium is on energy level number two. So this certainly makes sense. Sodium would have a lower first ionization energy than lithium and that's because sodium, I'm going to verbalize this explanation, sodium has three energy levels while lithium has two. Sodium has its valence electrons further from the nuclear charge thus the force is weaker. 
to remove an electron from sodium, to remove the first electron, valence electron from sodium, will be much, much easier than lithium's removal of its first valence electron. And that will then explain the removal is due to a weaker force on the valence electron for sodium than for lithium. And that's why sodium's first ionization energy is lower than lithium's first ionization energy. Okay. Go ahead and practice answering all of these questions and make sure you once again you look at my model to check not to copy to check each of your answers but you must practice answering yourself first this ends unit 2 our unit 2 video note taking